Uh, your Excellencies and expert panelists and dear participants, welcome to everyone to this uh, panel discussion on the European Union strategic compass and its impact for the Indo-Pacific region. We're delighted to have such a great turnout from many countries around the world. And I think it's a testament of the interest in these topics and the growing centrality, obviously, of the Indo-Pacific region as well. My name is Francesco Mancini. I'm a vice dean and associate professor in practice at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy at the National University of Singapore. And I'm honored to be your chair for today's panel discussion. Now, first of all, let me thank the co-organizer of this event, the embassies of France, Czech Republic, and Sweden in Singapore, and the EU delegation in Singapore. Thank you very much for bringing this opportunity to our school. And I also want to thank our panelists for accepting the invitation to share their expertise with us. And obviously, thanks to all of you for joining. Here, how we're going to organize our conversation. First, we'll have opening remarks from the ambassadors of France, Czech Republic, Sweden, and the EU delegation in Singapore. And after the opening remarks, I will ask our panelists uh, to share their insights. Then we will open up to your questions. So please type the questions in the Q&A space. Uh, we will then read them to, our panel, to the panelists. Um, I apologize in advance if we don't manage to answer all your questions. It's many of you, but we will do our best. If it all goes as planned, we should have a good 30, 35 minutes for the Q&A session. Now, I'm not going to say too much about the substance of our topic because we have much more expertise than I have in the panel, um, as well as in our ambassadors. But allow me just to say that the EU strategic compass is the first of its kind. It was formally adopted by the EU member states one month after the invasion of Ukraine in February this year. But obviously his preparatory process lasted longer, almost two years, and included the first ever joint threat analysis, which is also a very interesting component of it. And certainly the war in Ukraine has put new meaning to the compass, but as we are going to discuss here today, it has implication beyond Europe, and in particular for the Indo-Pacific region. So overall, with the strategic compass, the EU member states agree on a strategic vision for the EU roles in security and defense, and committed to a set of concrete objective to achieve in the coming five to, eight to 10 years, which are organized in four war stream, act, secure, invest, and partner. And the document, by the way, is available on the web. And so I encourage all of you to read it if you haven't yet. So enough said on my side. Uh, and now allow me now to introduce our first speaker for his opening remarks, Ambassador of France to the Republic of Singapore, His Excellency Marc Abensour. Now, Ambassador Abensour is a career diplomat. He was appointed Ambassador of France in Singapore in November 2016, um, and has passed appointments in the Ministry of Defense, in the Prime Minister Office, in NATO, as well as postings in the embassies in China and the US. Ambassador Abensour, thanks again uh, for being here with us. Uh, please get us started. Well, thank you very much, Professor Mancini, and uh... Good afternoon, good morning, everyone. For the sake of the discussion, I will um, keep it very, very short and trying to answer uh, three uh, quick uh, questions. First, uh, why uh, we should pay attention to the strategic concept. So it's indeed the first ever shared comprehensive assessment of the EU uh, strategic environment, the first uh, common threat analysis and uh, it is seen as actually the first uh, white book on defense uh, uh, for the uh, EU. And, um, and uh, the, the aim is to reinforce uh, the EU uh, strategic uh, autonomy and to make the EU uh, stronger and more capable as a security uh, provider. And as you also uh, recall, uh, it was adopted uh, uh, two months ago so the, um, the return of war in Europe with the Russian invasion of Ukraine has been fully uh, taken into account with all the, the consequences. Second question, why is it also uh, relevant for the ASEAN? Uh, strategic autonomy uh, for Europe makes ASEAN a natural partner 
and uh, both regions want to preserve autonomy of choice. As you know, the EU uh, was uh, EU status in its partnership was elevated uh, um, with ASEAN, so it has become a, a strategic partner of ASEAN, uh, and so this uh, opened up a, a new uh, chapter. The EU has the intention to reinforce uh, its uh, security contribution uh, in the region uh, through a joint partnership on cyber uh, cyber security, uh, maritime security, uh, counterterrorism, uh, and so on. And I would say that uh, the war in Ukraine. Uh, and the convergence of views uh, between our two regions uh, will also contribute to strengthen our cooperation. And, and third question, why this format today? Um, France, uh, uh, during its uh, presidency of the EU, made uh, the Indo-Pacific a priority. We organized in very close coordination uh, with the EES, uh, the European Commission uh, Ministerial Forum in February. And this uh, remain uh, at the top of the agenda with the following uh, presidency. So we did coordinate uh, for the sake of better continuity, better efficiency. And we see this as uh, uh, the best illustration of what we call Team Europe approach. So close coordination across the EU institution and with the member states. And I stop here. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Ambassador, uh, for providing the, the three answers to the three whys. Um, uh, really appreciate it. Um, allow me now to uh, uh, introduce our second speaker for the uh, opening remarks, uh, the European Union Ambassador in Singapore, Her Excellency Iwona Piorko. Uh, Ambassador Piorko has been in Singapore since September 2021, coming from Brussels, where her last appointment was a member of the Cabinet of the European Commission Executive Vice President uh, uh, Margrethe Verstager for Eurofit for the Digital Age. Ambassador Piorko, thank you for being with us. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me in this webinar that I consider extremely timely because of many reasons. Uh, most obviously, of course, the Russian aggression of Ukraine. Uh, as you all know, European Union started as a peace project, and this is something we should remember each day. This has not changed for all these years. We are all about peace. Um, the consequences of the Russian aggression are, however, felt all over the world. This invasion is creating uh, food shortages all over the world and many other challenges we have to tackle together. And we have to tackle them together also with the partners in the Pacific region. Uh, I think it has not yet been mentioned that the uh, European Union uh, adopted also in the Pacific strategy, or rather, as the title says, uh, strategy for cooperation in the Indo-Pacific. And this word is very important because it's indeed about cooperating with our partners here. And we treat this uh, uh, region extremely seriously. The region itself and the interconnection between this region and, and, and Europe. Next week here, uh, we're going to all witness uh, Shangri-La dialogue, a famous encounter of many defense ministers from across the globe. We will have uh, HRVP uh, Borel there as well. And we do think that shows very well the importance we attach to this region and the interconnection uh, with Europe. Strategic compass, a lot has been already said and will be said by our experts, including my colleague from External Action Service that has really been behind us from the beginning. But I think it's important to repeat what uh, you said in the opening, Professor, that sometimes our strategic compass is seen as a response to the aggression and it's not really. This was really a culmination of a long comprehensive consultative project process in which obviously this aggression has been very much taken into account, but it has been a, a long, a very thorough uh, preparation. And it's really all about EU becoming an even more reliable security provider. And it's basically our roadmap in three dimensions, in preparation, decision-taking and, and action, joint action. As um, HRVV Borel is often saying, EU is learning the language of power and strategic compass is a big element of it. And webinars as this one are definitely helping us to implement it. And so I'm very much looking forward to the discussion today. 
And I thank you once again for being able to address you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador. And, and thanks for reminding also of Europe as a project for peace, which in fact won the Nobel Peace Prize in, in, 12, in 2012. Um, thank you very much. I, I'm now gonna move to our third um, opening remarks uh, speaker, uh, who is uh, Her Excellency Michaela Frankova, Ambassador of the Czech Republic in Singapore. Now, ambassador Frankova has been ambassador in Lebanon and in Morocco before coming to Singapore, where she is the first resident Czech ambassador to Singapore following the reopening of the embassy in August 2020. Ambassador, thank you for being here. You have the floor. Oh, thank you very much, and uh, thank you for this opportunity to deliver some remarks on such an important topic as the EU strategic compass is, of course. Uh, allow me also to, to use this opportunity and to promote uh, the incoming Czech presidency of the European Union, of course, in the optic of the, and in the logic of the strategic compass. Uh, we will be presiding the European Union in a month. Uh, we'll, we will be taking up this role after more than a decade and uh, in a moment when security issues on the eastern flank of the European Union raise greater and greater concerns. And that is why the implementation of the compass will be among our priorities. Uh, in line with the ending French presidency and the Swedish presidency that will follow us, we will also focus very much on the Indo-Pacific region and certainly security issue, uh, which is no longer a regional but truly global, cannot be overlooked. Uh, so within the strategic compass, we will cooperate and exchange information with Indo-Pacific and ASEAN countries uh, on the topics such as extremism, cybersecurity, disaster relief, etc. And in this context, the Czech presidency and the European Union plan to organize a series of events with our partners, not only in Singapore, where we will talk mainly about how to be better prepared for and respond to cyber attacks, uh, but also in Bangkok, Hanoi, and Jakarta. Uh, where the discussions will mainly focus on space strategy for security and defense. So let me thank you for uh, this opportunity again. Thank you for your participation in this event and I hope to see you at a different occasion, hopefully in person. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. And, and also thank you for reminding us of uh, the coming presidency. Uh, for, for Czech Republic. Um, I would like now to give the floor to uh, His Excellency Kent Harstad, who is ambassador of Sweden in Singapore. Um, prior to his appointment in Singapore uh, since January this year, Ambassador Harstad had a, a number of parliamentary and government positions, including member of the Swedish parliament, a special envoy of the OSCE uh, chairperson in office. And he also remains the Swedish government special envoy for the Korean Peninsula. Ambassador, thanks uh, to you as well uh, for being here. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Professor. It's a pleasure to join in. In the preparation for my participation today, I actually uh, read a number of paper, amongst others, a position paper for my ministry about the strategic compass from December last year. And of course, given what uh, is right now raging in Europe, the war on Ukraine uh, by Russia, of course, this paper have become so much more relevant and the strategic compass is today something we, um, we must really consider as something so, so important for all of us. It's not just a, an academic or a political process, this is really uh, something uh, which is very useful for us to reflect upon with the, with the war raging. Um, I welcome, of course, today's constructive discussion on this uh, important topic of the strategic compass. Uh, and um, it shows that we need to continue this journey uh, together. Um, this, this compass is uh, not newly invented. I think it took its, its um, 
its starting point in the in the global strategy and uh, and uh, now um, I don't dare to challenge the professor who said it was decided in February in my paper it was in March but it definitely was very recently that it was um, decided upon now it comes to all of us and especially of course those who, who will uh, have the presidency of the European Union to help to push push this agenda forward from us, we have had um, uh, the position from the Swedish side that it will confirm the EU support for a rule-based world order, which of course very much challenged of what we see today, based on international law, including the UN Charter. It will offer support for effective multilateralism, contribute to, uh, to meet global challenges in an inclusive and sustainable way. It will also provide support for increased gender uh, mainstreaming and the implementation of the agenda for women, peace and se security, EPS. The strategic compass reflects that the EU security and defense policy cooperation takes place in a context of a number of bilateral, multilateral and regional cooperation that jointly contribute to a single European capability. The collaboration with Singapore and the Indo-Pacific is, of course, of crucial importance in this regard. And we look forward to continue the discussions with local partners here onwards. Uh, to conclude, I want to say I, I worked with the OEC until the end of last year. And of course, given what we see right now, it's, it's, a, it's really um, a, a period of time when I, I think many of us who have been working with, with what I just said um, um, really have to reinvent ourselves in, in some way in, in new realities. And of course, uh, I think that the EU strategic compass will be very important for us on the journey in the years to come, since this also is aiming for a five to 10 years perspective uh, where we uh, for so long lived without a war present, this of course gives a flavor for us of the uh, uh, seriousness of, of what this compass, which includes both security and defense capabilities, needs to, to uh, um, uh, um, uh, include. By that, I would like to give back to, uh, the, the floor to Professor Francesco Mancini and and I wish us all a, a good uh, conversation and um, uh, deep reflections of, of what, what the coming speakers will, will present to us. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Um, and also thank for clarifying. I, what I said is that it was produced one month after the war started in February, but my pose was not, was giving the impression that the paper was issued in February. Indeed, you are absolutely right. The paper was issued in March. Uh, 2022. Um, thank you very much for uh, uh, the opening remarks. I think it's very helped to kind of frame uh, the issue. Uh, and this concludes our round of, of, of opening uh, statements. And I, I would like to thank all the ambassador for, for taking the time uh, to share their thoughts uh, with us. Uh, very much appreciated. Appreciate um, thank you for your time. And, and I know you have uh, uh, other commitments, so feel free to, to take leave uh, if you need. Um, without further ado, I would like now to go straight into the panel presentations. And we have a top level uh, representation in our panel. And I really look forward to hearing from their insights as well. Uh, we will go in the order in which they are listed in the program and I will introduce them one at a time. Um, I will just give you a short version of their bios. And if you're interested in their very impressive uh, curricula, you can find them on the website, on our school website uh, under the current event. Um, I will ask them to keep their remarks within the 10 minutes so that we have ample time for our Q&A. Uh, for all of you participants, uh, as you hear uh, their insights, feel free to start to type your, your questions uh, in, uh, uh, in the Zoom uh, Q&A tab. So without further ado, let me introduce the first panelist, Mr. Jean-Pierre uh, Van Haubel, European External Action Service expert in defense policy and strategy. Now, beside his in impressive career in the Dutch government and then in the European Union, Mr. Van Haubel is the pen holder 
of the EU strategic compass. So who's better to give us an overview of what the compass is and also how it saw the light? Jean-Pierre, thank you very much. Uh, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Mancini, and many thanks for having me here today. And it's my pleasure to walk you in 10 minutes through the strategic compass. Uh, but obviously, uh, 10 minutes is rather short for a 46-page uh, document. So as said, you can look it up on the website, EAS website, and there's a whole lot more uh, uh, to understand better the strategic compass. But let me do it in three steps uh, uh, today. Uh, first, a little bit about the background, uh, then obviously about the content, and then uh, the way forward. And starting with the background, it has uh, said by uh, many of the uh, ambassadors and also by uh, Professor Mancini that the basis of this strategic compass is a threat analysis. And I think that many working in this field of security and defense or studying in security and defense would say, yes, that's pretty obvious that you start with a threat analysis. Well, it was the first time that we did this in the EU. Other organizations such as NATO, but also uh, member states and, and other countries have a long history of threat analysis. It's the first time that we did this at EU level. And that's already a very important step forward, I think. And it's a threat analysis that is based on input of 44 um, intelligence services, both civilian and military. Now, I cannot go, unfortunately, too much into the details of this threat analysis because it's a classified document. But on the other hand, many of you will know what's in that threat analysis because you can see it every day in the newspapers. You see it on television. It is about the uh, uh, changing global world order. It is about the growing threats against multilateralism, against the rules-based order. It is about big powers trying to threaten security and yes, of course, we speak here about Russia, but also about China. At the same time, we Europeans are confronted with growing conflicts in our neighborhood. On the one hand, on the east side, no need to explain, but also on the south side. And let's also not forget the southeast of European, uh, uh, the European continent, the Western Balkans. But the threat analysis also recognizes that this goes beyond our neighborhood. And obviously, the Indo-Pacific is an area that gets much attention, both in the threat analysis and in the strategic compass. Thirdly, we see growing emerging uh, threats and challenges. Think about hybrid threats. Think about cyber attacks, disinformation, but also more and more difficulties in having access to strategic domains. Think about here uh, maritime security, but also even in space. What struck me most about this threat analysis is not so much this analysis, because I think, again, that many of you would say, well, this sounds rather familiar. Uh, but I think what is more and more striking in today's world is the, is the interlinkage between all these uh, levels of threats. And if you look at Ukraine today, but again, I think you can say the same also for the Indo-Pacific. It's not just a regional uh, conflict or regional challenges. These are areas where big global powers play an important role trying to destabilize peace and security, which also affects us as Europeans. And at the same time, it's no longer only the use of conventional uh, means. And yes, I think with Ukraine, conventional means are back. It's also the use of unconventional means. Again, I mentioned hybrid attacks, cyber, uh, cyber attacks, and disinformation. We see this every day in many parts of the world. Well, that is the basis of the strategic compass and this threat analysis forms actually the first chapter of the strategic compass, which we have translated into a, a political chapter, of course. Um, and, and, and you can you can read that. Uh, uh, and it is in line with what I just said of the threat analysis. The second part of the compass then is to translate the answers to these challenges. And that we have done in four chapters, four big chapters. The first one is focusing on our classic task in crisis management. Uh, this is what we as European Union have always been focused on. It's what we call our common security and defense policy. These are our civilian and military missions outside the territory of the EU. Uh, you find them in Africa, you find them in the East, and we once even had it in uh, Indonesia. So, uh, this is about becoming a better actor in uh, uh, crisis management, because as European Union, we need to do better. We need to have more robust missions. 
we need to be able to respond quicker to crisis. And that also means that we need to be able to take faster decisions. And obviously this is a, a, a sensitive topic. It also means that we need to be better prepared to do crisis management. It means that our military need to be better trained. And that is why for the first time, Europeans have agreed to start doing as of next year, live exercises. Again, something that we did in other formats, NATO, UN, bilaterally, but never in the EU framework. And that is what the Compass now sets up. But I think the novelty of the strategic Compass is not so much to focus on crisis management. And I think we will have many challenges on crisis management in the years to come. Uh, think only already about the fact that many of our missions are based on a UN mandate. And I just only wonder how, as of now, that will go with a UN Security Council that is, can we say here, paralyzed? Um, but it's more than only about acting. It's more than only about crisis management. The threat analysis has shown us and experiences have learned us that security and defense is much wider than only crisis management. It's also about protecting ourselves against these threats and challenges. So we need to develop, and that's what member states agreed with the strategic compass. We need to develop tools to counter these hybrid threats. We need to develop tools to counter cyber attacks. And actually, I think we're already pretty efficient in that. Uh, we have already tools at our disposal, notably also sanctions uh, uh, that make that we can react quickly against cyber attacks. With the current situation, the question now raises whether we should also not be more proactive when it comes to the cyber domain. And of course, we need to have tools to counter this information. And this is something where actually as you, you are only at the beginning. More important, I mentioned the strategic domains, maritime security, and certainly in the Indo-Pacific is very, very, very important. And we have launched several initiatives there. We have a, a coordinated maritime presence where we combine national navies in an era present to share information with each other. And the member states have just a few uh, months ago decided to also do this in uh, the northwestern part of the Indo-Pacific. And I really believe that more is to come here. I mentioned space, growing important domain. European Union has done a lot in space, but mainly on the civilian side. With the Compass, we're now also going to look at the defense side. And I think that's very important. Look again at what happened last year uh, uh, in space with Russian debris threatening our uh, assets in space. And these assets, I don't have to explain it here, become more and more important. These are the two first operational chapters, but it's obviously very nice to have all sorts of ideas and goals on how you need to act better and how you need to secure better. These are the titles of the chapters. But if you don't have the means for that, then you won't probably get very far. So the third chapter focuses on invest. And invest means that we need to put our money where our mouth is. And as a defense expert, it's a bit cruel to say that in this uh, uh, time frame, I'm pretty happy that member states are now really uh, raising their defense budgets. I think that's the first step. But raising defense budgets is not the only thing. We need to obviously spend, as Europeans, we need to spend more on defense. We had years of decline after the end of the Cold War. I think uh, everybody would understand that it's time to raise our defense budget. But if we don't spend better at the same time, then this raise of defense uh, budgets is of no use in my view. And that's also what member states recognize in the strategic compass. And actually this was the topic of a discussion that our heads of states of government had earlier this week here in Brussels. And they've taken measures to further work on that. So member states not only agreed to spend more, they also agreed to spend better. What does that mean? That means that we need to overcome our capability gaps. In military domain, we still have critical capability gaps. Think for example about strategic airlift. And it's very simple. We have very good military in EU, but we still have very much difficulties in getting them quickly from A to B. And many of the assets that we uh, hired for this previously came either from Ukraine or from Russia. Now, good luck with that, I would say. So very important that we overcome these capability gaps. At the same time, we also need to invest better in technologies and we need to remain at the technological edge. 
very important that we do that. Now, these are the three uh, uh, first chapters of the operational chapters of the compass, which if you want, and I think this is the words that the French ambassador used also, can define as strengthening the EU strategic autonomy. It is about how we can act better, how we can protect better, and also how we can invest better. But we also have to recognize, and 27 minister, uh, member states are of that opinion, we have to recognize that most of the time we do this together with partners, and that is the last chapter in the strategic compass. So not only do, do we as Europeans need to do more and better, we also need to strengthen our ties with partners. And obviously that goes with international organizations such as the UN and NATO, but certainly also with an organization such as ASEAN, I think very important, but it also goes with countries individually and partnerships with countries individually need to be strengthened and it needs to be more tailor-made. That is what the strategic compass uh, recognizes. Many of the countries in the Indo-Pacific are directly mentioned in the strategic compass. Uh, and it's very important that we strengthen our ties, not only in our cooperation in our missions and operations, but also in all these other domains. That is very important that I think together we defend this rules-based order. Now, that's in short the strategic compass. Very briefly, because I know that I'm coming to the limits uh, of the 10 minutes, a uh, uh, very quick look ahead. What makes this document so special? First of all, it was said already by one of the ambassadors, it's for the first time a strategy that is adopted by all member states. So 27 member states, ministers of defense, ministers of foreign affairs, and heads of states and government signed up to this. So there's a strong commitment to make this work. Secondly, I'm in Brussels today, uh, the country of René Magritte. So I always say, ceci n'est pas une stratégie. This is not a strategy. So it is a strategy and it's not a strategy. It has the forward looking uh, part in it. It has the description of the world, the shared assessment of 27 member states, but it's also actionable. It has 81 actions in all these domains that I just mentioned. And actually out of these 81, 51 already need to be implemented this year. So uh, without further ado, I'll stop here. We have a whole lot of work to do in the four or five months to come. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to the discussion and the questions. Back to you, Professor Mancini. Great, thank you so much. Uh, you can see, you know, this inside out, a fantastic way to summarize uh, a, a rather uh, dense document in, in 10 minutes. Um, thank you very much. Um, I think for all participants, you know, the, the, the gist of it obviously is that there's a sort of a challenge component, uh, which um, as you've seen is not just conventional war or for today, you know, we have an emphasis on that, but obviously goes in other domains uh, including the virtual and, and, and the outer space. And then the bulk obviously on the answers, right? Which is organized in these four streams. Some are more focusing on the operational, uh, which misses the less new part, uh, but there's also very new components in it. And then on resources and resources include uh, investment as well as uh, partners. Thank you very much for the summary. Um, I'm now gonna move to our second uh, expert uh, panelist, uh, and I'm delighted to uh, welcome Dr. Pierre Haroche, who is a research fellow in the European security at the Institute for Strategic Research in Paris. And he was formerly also a professor like me, uh, teaching at King's College London and Sorbonne University. Uh, Pierre, thank you for being with us and you have the floor. Thank you very much. And I'm very happy to have this, uh, as was previously said, very interesting and timely uh, discussion. What I will do is that I will uh, try to comment a little bit the, the, the part of the strategy compass that relate to the Indo-Pacific, uh, put them into perspective and also perhaps add a, um, a, a, fr a French view of these uh, elements, if I may. So if we start with the question of the threat um, analysis, because uh, as was mentioned earlier, it is the first part of the of the of the strategy compass obviously uh, the main question is how to characterize china how does the european union view uh, china um i think it is fair to say that um uh, not so long time ago china was not necessarily seen as a major security issue in many european countries i can remember that a few years ago 
um, the ECFR, the European Council on Foreign Relations, published an opinion poll conducted among European elites and put it in a map um, with the question, do you see China as a, a major security issue or something like that? I, I think it was conducted in 2018 or 19. And basically, in most European countries, the, the, the answer was not a concern. Only a few European countries, in particular France, uh, were, uh, responded positively that China was definitely a concern for them. So I would say that if we go through the question of China, the Indo-Pacific is a relatively new concern to, in terms of uh, security and uh, threat perception in the European Union. Um, I, I'd say that for France, um, um, a key moment in its awareness of uh, China being a, a major source of concern and the Indo-Pacific being an important uh, question. First, there is the, um, the fact that uh, for a long time, uh, France has always have, uh, uh, had a, a, a global approach to security. Uh, it's not necessarily the case for all European countries. And also because it has some small territories in the Pacific, France has been always uh, aware of the, uh, they're very much interested in what's going on in the Indo-Pacific. But um, when it comes to China, I think a key turning point was 2017 when China established a military base in Djibouti. Because uh, that meant that uh, the Belt and Road Initiative and the Chinese influence project um, could actually um, come much closer to, to, to our core interests, to the Mediterranean, to Africa, to EU's neighborhood. And that was, I think, an important moment in particular for the French. And for both reasons, so the, 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 the old interest for global uh, security issues and this realization, more recent realization, France, I think, was among the the, 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 those countries that pushed uh, other partners uh, in favor of uh, uh, try to raise awareness in the European Union about uh, the Indo-Pacific. Of course, there are very good uh, uh, European level arguments to do that. And in particular, uh, we can, uh, the, 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 the strategic compass mentioned the importance of sea lines of communication. We should actually underline that as a trading block, the European Union is actually more dependent on Indo-Pacific sea line of communications than the United States, for instance. So if anything happens in that region, if there is a conflict in that region, we will be very much affected. And I think COVID really uh, um, illustrated that, even though it was not a military conflict, but the disruption in terms of uh, um, uh, supply and we also saw that uh, recently with the lockdown in Shanghai. When there is a problem in Asia, it has massive implications for our economies. So if only for that reason, the Indo-Pacific um, should be a key concern. Of course, there was also a push from the United States, um, in particular during the Trump administration in 2019, in particular through the question of uh, economic influence, the 5G and so on, um, the, the uh, Americans really uh, contributed largely to raising awareness among Europeans about the importance of China. And I think that many European countries that were not necessarily directly interested in the Pacific uh, security in China became more interested, not necessarily to please the Americans, but to be able to respond and to understand uh, US concerns, because obviously, um, in particular in the NATO framework, if you're not able to understand and to respond to US demands, uh, uh, NATO is nothing without the United States. So you have to, to take that into account. So these are, I would say, the origins of the security concerns. And the key moment was the, two, the, the 2019 um, uh, communication on the EU-China strategy, um, the joint uh, joint communication by uh, the External Action Service and the European Commission, with this now famous wording about China being, at the same time, an economic uh, a potential partner on global issues such as climate change, um, an economic competitor, but also a systemic rival. And actually, the the strategy compass is in the continuation of that wording. Uh, this try polar wording. And 
it's also very consistent with um, NATO's conceptualization of China as a challenge. So the main important point I would say is that China is acknowledged by both the EU and NATO as a challenge, a serious challenge, but not put in the same basket as Russia. For, for NATO, and I think we will have the confirmation of that uh, assessment in the next uh, strategic concept. For NATO, Russia is a threat, terrorism is a threat, China is a challenge. Uh, basically the same for the European Union. Uh, the strategic compass uh, says that Russia is a direct and long-term threat to the European Union. On the other hand, uh, China is uh, at the same time this partner, competitor and systemic rival. So not in the at the same level. Um, so the, uh, uh, moving on to the responses after the, the, the assessment, uh, the question is, uh, uh, what, 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 how can we respond to that? How can we be involved in the security of the Indo-Pacific? Um, initially, I think a key question, in particular for the French, was how can we, after having raised awareness, how can we attract uh, our European partners in the region? Um, the coordinated maritime presence was mentioned. And for some time, there was even a debate about the possible implementation of the coordinated maritime presence concept in the South China Sea, for instance. But um, a, a problem that was raised in particular in Paris was, if we implement the coordinated maritime presence in the South China Sea, with whom will we coordinate? With our own boats? Uh, because obviously, not so many European uh, member states are active in the region. France is active. Um, Germany sometimes uh, send uh, frigates in the region, but it's not yet uh, a massive presence that we can observe. So that's why uh, France in particular defended the idea that perhaps at, as a first step, it would be um, smarter to focus on a more modest uh, approach, a more progressive approach, and focus on the Indian Ocean, closer to us, uh, but still uh, a first way to, to, to a first step towards the Indo-Pacific. And um, so I think we can understand uh, all the initiatives that are mentioned in the uh, strategy compass, like um, the, the possibility to have to to strengthen partnerships with uh, 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 with um, regional partners, um, the possibility to use the uh, peace facility um, in the region, the possibility to conduct live exercise in the regions. They could be also understood as ways to um, uh, to, to 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 create the habits to create uh, uh, to to push Europeans to to be. Um, uh, to be more present, more active in the region, and to be uh, more culturally um, uh, 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 acclimated to the security uh, issues in the region. And I think it's also um, connect to another trend, a more general trend, among the European Union strategy, um, because uh, there are some maritime operations, but we increasingly see these operations, I would say, not just as mission to perform a specific uh, objective, but as um, uh, a presence. So we can now understand that uh, these operations uh, do not necessarily have to end when the mission ends. It's not because the anti-piracy mission of Operation Atalanta and that our presence in the Indian Ocean has to end. So if uh, we understand these operations in terms of presence, it means that perhaps uh, Atalanta and also in coordination with MSO, because there are also elements in the uh, strategic compass in terms of the coordination between EU and non-EU, but nevertheless European-led mission, uh, these operations can also uh, constitute the first step towards a longer term presence, strategic presence uh, of the European Union in the Indian Ocean and through the Indian Ocean, um, uh, a first foot into the, in the, in the, in the Indo-Pacific region. And I have other things to add, but I'll stop there uh, for the first uh, presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh
Great, thank you very much. And, and, and thank you for uh, slowly shifting into the Indo-Pacific area and, and put a focus on that part of the world um, and obviously on China. Uh, um, probably one of the you know, biggest diplomatic challenge. Uh, and, and I think the EU definition of, of both uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, a systemic rival and an economic competitor, as well as uh, um, uh, uh, a partner for cooperation and negotiation, it's really will reside this kind of tension. And also for remind some of the steps uh, toward uh, more EU strategic presence in this part of the world. Um, excellent. And I, I believe we will continue along these lines um, uh, of focus on uh, the uh, Indo-Pacific with our third uh, panelist, uh, Dr. Alesh uh, Karmazin, who is a researcher and academic of the Department of Asian Studies of the Metropolitan University, Prague. Uh, he's also a visiting research fellow at Peking University, and uh, he will focus on the security relation between EU and the Indo-Pacific. So we will discuss more the implication of the compass for uh, this part of the world. Alex, thank you for being here. Um, you have the floor. Thank you, Francesco. Uh, dear excellencies, dear colleagues, dear guests, it's, I'm, I'm honored to join the discussion and I will continue shifting from Europe to, to Indo-Pacific, but uh, nevertheless, let me, let me, let bear with me and let me start with the one point which concerns, let's say, European politics and European foreign policy, let's say in general, uh, it's kind of strategic foreign policy uh, observation. And I think that, um, uh, for some time, uh, there's been a mismatch or disproportion between, let's say, the Euro European, I'm talking very generally, both at the level of EU and European countries, uh, European ambition to do something about China and Russia on the one hand, and uh, our dedication of capabilities, of abilities, of tools to actually do that. So I think there is a mismatch between high aims on the one hand and uh, relatively mild or not so bold uh, tools and means on the other hand. And uh, the compass, the compass strategy is not going to solve it completely, but I think it's a good step it's a right step in a good direction. Uh, so I think it's a like a promising step that uh, we can start with and build upon in uh, to to address these challenges because I think definitely uh, the recent uh, recent crisis and the war between Russia and Ukraine only accentuated these challenges and this this disproportion and this mismatch. And obviously the China question is going to be also very important in this regard. So this is the first thing, but. Um, when it comes to when it comes to the implications of the strategic compass for Indo-Pacific region, I think I would like to um, talk about three levels: uh, the level of the European Union, uh, just briefly; the level of individual European countries, and maybe give you some kind of perspective from the Czech Republic. Um, but again, in their policies towards the Indo-Pacific, and then third level, which concerns, uh, let's say, the region, Indo-Pacific region itself. So when it comes to uh, the European level, I'm not going to go into details. I think a couple of points, important points have been mentioned by Jean-Pierre and Pierre previously. And um, uh, what I kind of want to highlight, what basically what was, what was highlighted before was basically that there are different documents and strategic conception that the EU or EU partners have. And uh, I kind of, I, I see the compass as a, as a promising document because it's quite, closely and nicely aligned with uh, especially the uh, EU strategy for Indo-Pacific, the EU strategy for cooperation with the Indo-Pacific. Uh, although the strategy for Indo-Pacific is much broader, it concerns also human rights and, and trading routes and, and connectivity and other stuff. I think these documents go quite well together. And especially as, as uh, Pierre just mentioned at the very end of his talk, I think it's very important that the uh, concept document um, can be quite complementary with the um, with the 2019 document on China, the EU document on China, which defines China in a in the multifaceted manner as a both or as a systemic competitor, uh, economic rival, but also trading partner. So I think the compass is very nicely put together in a sense that it has this flexibility. You know, strategy 
strategies and strategy documents, they sometimes they they do not or do not have to follow just one direction. They kind of need to follow complicated world and complicated situation in world in the in the world, uh, and uh, they should be able to address uh, different facets, different levels. So it's important from the perspective of indiv individual countries. And now I maybe I'm going to bring a perspective from a scholar who is located in um, basically uh, in the Czech Republic, uh, in Prague, uh, basically in the region we sometimes call, uh, we sometimes call um, Central and Eastern Europe. And uh, I think that some of these Central and Eastern European countries, uh, they don't have or didn't have that well articulated Indo-Pacific or Asia-Pacific strategy. So, and, and the Czech Republic probably has been one of those countries, uh, although we definitely do have some good relationship between the Czech Republic and some uh, East Asian uh, Indo-Pacific countries, definitely that's, that's definitely true. But when it comes to the conceptual strategic definition of uh, the Czech approach towards Indo-Pacific, um, it's been currently developed. And I think uh, the compass is really important even for the states like Czech Republic that we have a template to follow. Because, you know, sometimes it's difficult to create these documents, uh, such strategic documents or conceptions, simply because you know, bureaucratic politics, different different interests, governments changing. Uh, there may be they, there might be different reasons, and I think it's nice to have a certain template or certain key things to follow. And I think it it should help. And my gut feeling is that it it will, it, it will be very helpful for those people that are responsible for let's say crafting Indo-Pacific strategy in the Czech Republic. So I think it the implication goes even inside European countries and for their orientation towards uh, Indo-Pacific. And that's, again, an important aspect. And the last level, which I would like to comment very briefly on, is also what uh, about implications for the Indo-Pacific countries. So the region we are talking uh, about mainly. Um, so um, as mentioned previously, the compass um, comes up or mentions a couple of different tools, strategies, types of actions. Uh, I really like, for example, that uh, the stress is on partnership. I think it's very important. Uh, but uh, basically, I would divide it into two main categories and basically say that the Compass talks or develops, let's say, the traditional CSDP uh, instruments, mechanisms, basically, policies for the so-called common uh, security and defense policy of the European Union, which, which has been kind of the traditional mechanism how um, the EU develops and acts. Um, and these mechanisms have been mentioned just, just briefly, like crisis management uh, and also the, the, uh, the Compass also develops the idea of, let's say, rapid uh, deployment of forces outside outside European Union. Um, and I think these things can be important. They may be used sometimes at certain point, but uh, they are not going to be the primary ones towards the Indo-Pacific. Um, I think that the uh, mechanism of the rapid uh, deployment of troops, I think there is the proposal of creating uh, 5,000 troop, let's say unit or group that can be rapidly deployed. I think it's going to be like, practically speaking, uh, it's going to be more used in the European continent or European neighborhood. Um, to be honest, I cannot see it to be deployed in the most heated, most conflictual areas of, let's say, Indo-Pacific, like for example, South China Sea conflict or potentially some potential escalation in the cross-strait region between China and Taiwan. I don't see it happening. Um, Still, it's important that this mechanism is available uh, and it's also one of the means how to address the mismatch I was talking at the beginning. Uh, but what I think is even kind of perhaps more important uh, is uh, that these uh, the, the other means that are mentioned by the compass, uh, which are related to, let's say, security issues, but I would say not that typical hard security issues, including cyber, including also environment, uh, securing maritime routes and, and, and uh, this type of things, uh, in, including also intelligence sharing. And I think it will be particularly important and that's basically 
the area or the areas where I think uh, we can we can really have some trust and hope that uh, the compass will help really develop actually develop practical practical relationships between the EU and the partners the partnerships uh, in the Indo-Pacific region, especially as, as it's mentioned Japan and 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 ASEAN countries. Uh, so. Um, in particular, there are some, some specific mechanisms that are kind of in between these measures. Uh, they might be important as well. I think there, there's, there's been tried and tested cooperation in, in protecting critical maritime routes. That's something that could happen as well. And I think, again, is, is important. So um, maybe by, by concluding or to conclude uh, my, my talk and not to make it uh, super long and to give space for q and I would say that, uh, in, in general, uh, the, the, the compass is really promising and it can be really seen as promising, even from the perspective of uh, Indo-Pacific countries, because I think that in a sense, they can help them document and the new, obviously not just the document, but obviously hopefully the new actual approach, practical approach of the European Union can help them in, I'm going to call it, somewhat imprecisely complex deterrence and i'm i know i'm going kind of towards the realm of kind of hawkish to realistic uh to realist uh, language of uh, international relations but let's let's use it uh, and uh it can help the regional actors in their effort to kind of deter balance and kind of cope with china obviously i think the eu in, in upcoming years should not be probably expected to put their troops in uh, or to use their troops in the South China Sea conflict, for example, or something like that. It would be probably too much hope, I would say, it's my personal view. But, uh, you know, deterrence or kind of the balancing thing is kind of more complex issue, more, more complex things. And even uh, for countries like Singapore, ASEAN countries, Japan, it may be important to have like stronger, more viable, more operational partnerships with, uh, with European countries. The EU compass probably is a good step in the direction and it might have some like broader regional consequences. And uh, that's, I think the good point to stop and uh, uh, let the others uh, follow me follow follow with the topic uh, wonderful Th thanks Alash. Uh, th th that was great that was great uh, and, and also helpful to kind of uh, look at this broader mass of the indo-pacific impact right what do we mean by that implications kind of these three areas that you mentioned the implications that are more eu level uh implications that are more at member state level um it's, it's interesting how you actually mentioned that some part of europe might have had less emphasis right on the indo-pacific and, and this is a document that can help to uh, raise that awareness and develop uh, strategies at the national level um, and then obviously for our region here um of what these implications are um and i think a lot of questions very interesting question we can follow up uh, later on to go deeper so thank you for that um i would like now uh, go to our uh, fourth um and last panelist uh, who is uh, mr august danielson uh, who is an associate fellow at the European Program of the Institute of International Affairs, as well as a PhD candidate at the Uppsala University in, in Sweden. Um, thank you for being here, and we look forward to your com uh, comments as well. Uh, August, you, you, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Francesco. Uh, yes, so as um, Professor Mancini just mentioned, I'm a PhD candidate at uh, Uppsala University in Sweden. And uh, since my dissertation research uh, focuses quite a lot on EU foreign and security policy, I'm very happy to uh, have been invited to this discussion. Uh, so my talk will uh, differ a little bit from the other panelists, uh, and I guess also reflect a little bit about this differing emphasis that uh, among EU member states that, uh, that Alash just brought up, uh, since I, I think Sweden might, might be one of those uh, states that might put a little bit of less emphasis, I guess, on the Indo-Pacific region in comparison to some of the others. But so my, my talk will then focus instead on the strategic compass from a, a Swedish perspective, as well as how the, uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine uh, also affects the role of the uh, strategic compass uh, for Sweden. 
So as uh, many of you uh, probably know by now, Sweden and Finland uh, recently applied to become members of NATO. And this, of course, is a monumental shift in Swedish security policy, as we have up until this moment uh, been militarily non-aligned for over 200 years. Uh, however, of course, the, the recent Russian invasion of Ukraine has, has led to a drastic uh, shift in thinking in both uh, Helsinki and in Stockholm. And it was clear early on that Finland took the lead in this uh, NATO uh, membership application. And, and once this was the case that, that they would apply, Sweden basically had no other option than to apply as well. Uh, we could simply not be the, the only Nordic country without NATO membership, as that would put both us and the other Nordic countries at a greater risk in case of uh, military aggression from Russia. As Sweden is, of course, not yet members of NATO, uh, and we will see how this uh, threat of the, the Turkish veto will play out. It is difficult to know precisely, I would say, what the current Swedish military strategic doctrine is. Uh, prior to the 2022 Russian invasion of Ukraine, our security policy could essentially be summarized in the notion of solidarity. Uh, through bilateral, minilateral, and multilateral agreements and institutions, the idea behind the Swedish military strategic doctrine has been to increase other countries' willingness to come to our aid in case of an attack on our territory uh, by deepening our ties and, and basically showing solidarity to others. Uh, for instance, many of the government bills on Swedish participations in, in military operations abroad have explicitly stated that one of the main aims of our participation is precisely to increase other states' willingness to, to come to our aid in case we were the target of an attack. And it, in addition, we have deepened our bilateral ties with the United States for the same reason, for instance, through the uh, procurement of the Patriot missile system. However, uh, if or rather when we become members of NATO, I would argue that the logic of this solidarist security policy uh, completely goes out the window. Um, there is simply no need to strive to increase other states' feelings of solidarity for us, either through participation in military operations abroad or through the procurement of military equipment if we are members of NATO. Uh, we will then instead simply get this solidarity uh, as a result of, of Article 5. Uh, and this guarantee, I would say, will, will be upheld regardless of our actions to increase other states' solidarity, to put it bluntly. Now, what, is, what does this shift then in Swedish military strategic doctrine mean for uh, the EU's foreign and security policy and the relevance of the strategic compass for Sweden? So first of all, uh, Sweden's role in the development of the uh, common security and defense policy has usually been that of a naysayer together with the United Kingdom. Uh, now that the UK has left, we have had to adapt our role uh, and become a bit more pragmatic, I would say. So while we still sort of put a lot of emphasis on the civilian side of the CSDP and the EU's comparative advantage in carrying out civilian operations in comparison to, for instance, NATO, I think we are starting to accept that the EU may become a more potent military actor in the coming years. For instance, the, the relative success of the use of the European peace facility in supporting Ukraine uh, may be one step in the direction from our sort of traditional role as an, as an obstacle for greater EU coordination on arms export and the harmonization on, on the EU's defense industry. Um, so time will tell, but I think we are seeing uh, sort of steps in that direction due to the war in Ukraine. It is also not completely unthinkable, I would say, that our membership in NATO will lead us to become more of a sort of a mainstream uh, actor in um, the CSDP, given that many of our positions regarding the EU's defense policy have been based on the fact that we have been militarily non-aligned as well. And regarding the strategic compass, I, I think one of the main benefits uh, that the compass sort of could have provided uh, for Sweden prior to the Russian invasion of Ukraine um, and Sweden's NATO membership application was that it simply could have provided a better platform for conducting crisis management operations abroad, which in turn could have then helped to sort of strengthen this solidarist security policy that I mentioned before. And given that Sweden likely now, if we become members of NATO, has sort of less of a need to conduct military operations abroad simply for the purposes of sort of creating solidarity and, and thus sort of indirectly strengthening our, our, our territorial defense. I think you could also argue that the compass in this sense has become a little bit less relevant for Sweden. 
Um, I would also say that the strategic compass should probably be regarded less as an instrument that enables the EU to act differently in the future, uh, but rather as a collection of ideas and, and thoughts about the type of actor that the EU um, should be, or that the EU member states want the EU to be, basically. Uh, so in this sense, I, I also think that the strategic compass is not uh, that new. I mean, we've had these sort of statements of intent previously, such as the 2003 European uh, security strategy and the 2016 EU global strategy. Um, and I guess you could also argue that sort of this EU rapid deployment capacity uh, is quite similar to the uh, existing EU battle groups. And, and I would also say that the, the strengthening sort of uh, the EU's capacity to, to uh, conduct its own uh, uh, military and civilian operations through the EU military planning and, and conduct capability does not really uh, overcome this, this obstacle of the EU member states retaining the control of their military forces. Uh, in in these missions and operations, so I think there are still um, a few obstacles and challenges uh, that that remain uh, despite the this uh, the strategic compass. But um, we will see uh, how we move on from here. Um, but in essence, uh, what, what I'm trying to argue here is that the, the aim of the strategic compass to sort of increase the EU's capacity to act together in different types of crises is not sort of solved through these statements of intent, but rather through a shared threat assessment and a common sense of purpose that I think is brought about mainly through a crisis that, that would unify uh, the, the EU's member states. Uh, however, I'm skeptical that even the, the Russian invasion of Ukraine will lead to this common threat assessment. Um, geography still matters quite a lot, and the EU's member states will likely retain their uh, different uh, strategic cultures uh, as well. And I think one of the main reasons for this is that the United States still plays the role as the main security provider in Europe. And this, uh, I think, enables EU member states to not prioritize the Russian threat, which then paradoxically weakens the EU's capacity to defend itself. Uh, this does not mean that the situation can ever change, uh, especially if we see Trump or, or someone similar in the, in the White House soon again. Um, so this might be a little bit of a more pessimistic view, <laughs> I guess, than some of our other previous uh, discussions here. But to uh, conclude, I would just like to emphasize that I think the, the Russian invasion of, uh, of Ukraine has, has clearly changed how EU member states, including Sweden, uh, view the role of the EU and NATO in providing security in Europe. Uh, I would argue that NATO has clearly become the sole provider uh, of security in terms of territorial defense, uh, while the EU is still struggling to define its role. Um, and this may lead in the future to a more clear division of labor, uh, where the EU further enhances its civilian and military crisis management capabilities in line with the ambitions set out in the strategic compass. But it may also lead to further debates about the potential role of the EU as a geopolitical actor that, that tries to emulate NATO. Uh, and I think that the former would, would clearly be a lot more productive than, than the latter. Uh, but I guess we will see where we end up. So yeah, thanks for listening. Wonderful. Thank you very much, uh, August. That, that, that's great. Um, you add yet another interesting component to the conversation with a particular focus, obviously, on Sweden. Uh, but as you mentioned, there is some monumental shift here uh, that has to be uh, definitely discussed. Uh, but also bringing NATO in the conversation. I think that that's very important uh, in the overall European scenario. Um, so all, all very much appreciated. Uh, this is great. Um, we have approximately let's say 20 minutes um, for, for a discussion, a conversation. So I encourage uh, all participants uh, to put your questions up. Uh, we already received some. And uh, the, the, the way we're gonna do it is I'm going to read some questions, uh, maybe two or three to our uh, panelists, uh, and then I revert to the panel. So maybe we do that twice. So we get a couple of, of exchanges and, and I leave to our uh, panelists to choose um, what they would like and prefer to, uh, to answer. Um, so le let me maybe start with uh, a rather general uh, kind of question, um, which is, you know, I, I think you, you all mentioned that the um, Compass is a rather ambitious document. And I think we all kind of agree that it's setting up, um, you know, multiple actions, obviously, but also kind of a very ambitious sort of strategic goal. 
um, East, Europe has a has a mixed history of of agreeing on on defense and, and security policy uh, at best. Um, and I wonder if obviously there is a, an historic circumstances right now with a particular threat that has probably maybe pushed to our, um, you know, um, a unified position. Uh, is your feeling that um, this uh, compass has also teeth? Do you feel that being sitting in Europe, uh, there is a sort of a political commitment, right, from different member states to move this uh, paper into, into real action? Right, into real investments? Do you have a sense that that is, uh, is, is forthcoming? Um, and I guess the second question, which is also related, it's, okay, we talk about 81 actions. Uh, do you feel that there is any priority here? Do you feel any particular countries maybe um, uh, pushing for, for certain um, uh, actions rather than others? Uh, but where, or, or where you as expert would put your sort of priority? Um, uh, right now, given the overall circumstances. And maybe a third question, uh, let's look at the Indo-Pacific, right? And, and uh, um, uh, does the, uh, uh, you know, the European Union um, or, or, or France uh, will, uh, you know, continue um, more sort of traditional relationship with with countries that has been very close to the Western world, like Japan or, or Korea, maybe. Um, how do they deal particularly with China? I mean, you mentioned um, um, uh, the way the European Union has defined China, both as a, as a partner as well as a competitor. Um, any, any thoughts there on how the Compass can help to orientate the European Union in dealing uh, both with historic allies, as well as with uh, powers like China. So let me start with that. Um, and uh, um, I, I leave to you if you who, who wish to start. Um, we, we can go maybe in the, in the same order we, we started and maybe we go in reverse order next time. Um, so maybe Jean-Pierre, if you want to start with some of your thoughts. Yeah, thanks a lot. And let me start with that last question since it's also a birthday in the Pacific today, of course. Uh, no, it's absolutely right. And I think it's also fair to say that as European Union was still struggling a little bit with how to deal with China. Uh, and you see this in the compass, it was mentioned by Pierre Roche, uh, we define uh, China both as a partner for cooperation, a uh, economic competitor and a systemic rival. So uh, three options to choose off, I would say. Um, clearly indeed also in the compass, and this is obviously aligned with the policy on China that we have for, for a few years now, clearly, um, not in the same category as Russia. On the other hand, we do have growing concerns, I think, about the position of China, both in terms of the military buildup, uh, but also its role in, in, in several parts of the Indo-Pacific and the, the Southeast Sea. I think that that is something that you cannot deny. So it's something that we need as Europeans to get a close eye on now. Uh, the compass focuses on security and defense. Our policy with China goes way beyond that. Uh, I think we also try at the political level to, to, to have a strong dialogue with China and to keep talking with China and to uh, try to reassure how difficult that sometimes is to have uh, uh, China on the, on, on, on the right side of history, if you can use those uh, cliche words. So, uh, I think that will remain a challenge for, for, for the time being. At the same time, I think as Europeans, we've also discovered that we, on, in many areas, are quite dependent from China. And that's why I mentioned this topic of technologies, um, very important. Uh, these days here in, in, in this side of the world, we talk a lot about dependencies from Russia, uh, but we have also a lot of dependencies from China. And here, I think as Europeans, we're asking ourselves the question now, to what extent do we want to be dependent from a country like China? Uh, and that's something in the year to come that we need to address. And that is also in the area of security and defense. On the other hand, uh, uh, partnering with other countries in uh, uh, the Indo-Pacific area is very important. And the compass speaks about Japan, but also about the Republic of Korea, about Vietnam, Indonesia, uh, and a whole lot of more countries where in the area of security and defense, we had already uh, quite close partnerships. Uh, some of these countries contributed to our missions and operations and still do. Um, uh, with others, we have strong cooperation on, on, uh, in maritime security. And I think the recent 
exercises that we have in the naval exercises with many of these countries in the Indo-Pacific together with our operation Atalanta are a very good uh, example. And the Compass mentions even more examples of, of doing uh, joint exercises and even joint port calls. I think uh, not only from a military perspective important, also from a diplomacy perspective, very important. So uh, 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 we are very much interested in, in further developing that. And I know that uh, many of these countries have the same interest. We had in the run up to the strategic compass, but also now in the aftermath of the strategic compass, very close ties with Japan. And not on, only on maritime security or on concerns of, of China, but also in, on, on issues such as cybersecurity and hybrid threats. Uh, and it's very important that we exchange our views there and that we also see how we can support each other and how we can uh, work closely together. So um, I do see a lot of potential there for, for the years to, uh, to come. Now about uh, the ambition of the strategic compass and, and will it be implemented and what will, what will come of it? Of course, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. But um, again, compared to previous strategies, I think it's very important that this strategy is the one that is adopted by all 27 member states. Secondly, member states have also agreed that the HRVP was the sort of the guider for the last two years for the establishment of this compass, but it doesn't stop there. Uh, they have also uh, agreed that the HRVP will produce every year a uh, progress report um, on, on the progress on all these actions. So uh, it's not just a one-off document and then uh, well, we have nice seminars about it and then it disappears. No, we need to come back every year to where the progress is. Yesterday I was in another panel and I got the question, yeah, but what is the consequence if member states don't live up to it? The answer is honestly, no consequence. Uh, that's also the European Union. But on the other hand, I think that if we produce a report every year and we discuss this at the highest level, because that is the, that's the deal. Uh, this is not going to happen at that at working level. This is going to be discussed at heads of states and government. And I don't think that many heads of states and government feel comfortable if after a year the conclusion is that we have only implemented half of what uh, they, they agree. Uh, so there is a push and there is commitment. And yes, these are special times um, um, and, and, and uh, very worrying times, of course. And I think what I've seen over the last two months happening, uh, and it's almost ironic to say that, of course, because it happens in, in over, over a terrible war that is on our continent. But we've seen so many actions been taken over the last two months that weren't possible in the last 20, 30 years. European peace facility was mentioned. I've led negotiations, negotiations on this peace facility and one of the main obstacles was for many countries, uh, the delivery of lethal equipment. And if you had asked me in January, if we would ever use this EPF, I would have asked you which kind of uh, roll glass of beer you had the night before. Today, we spent 2 billion euros in support of Ukraine. And out of this 2 billion euros, 95% on lethal equipment. And even countries who had negotiated before not being part of this voted in favor of this. Uh, and I think these are all very, very important developments. And of course, we'll talk uh, about uh, Sweden and Finland becoming a member of NATO. And I really think that that is a positive development. Let's also not forget what happened yesterday. Yesterday, there was a referendum in Denmark Denmark was not part of the military policy and the security policy of the Union for the last 30 years. And the Danish people have voted now for an opt-in. So Denmark will also be part of uh, um, the EU's development on security and defense. Denmark was already, of course, a member of NATO. And I think it's very important that as European countries, we have that unity, both in NATO and in the European Union. And uh, I, I, I know that, that some uh, try to, to, to have a competition between the EU and NATO. I think with all the challenges that we have, not only in our neighborhood, but certainly also uh, uh, outside. And again, I speak about the in the Pacific, there is room for all of us. There's so much to do in terms of challenges and threats that both the EU and NATO need to line up and that all the member states and allies need to 
uh, work together in that. And I think that is very important for uh, the time to come. Let me stop here. Thanks. Thanks, Jean-Pierre. Thank you very much. I, I think you, you answered very, very well. Uh, Pierre, can, can I get to you? And also, I wanted to uh, mention that there is a specific question on Japan, uh, which also asks France, right? France on, on what um, engagement uh, from, from Sato Tanaka. So I wonder if you, if you want to also address that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, regarding the, the first question and the role of the European Union, I completely agree with the fact that uh, the idea that uh, the, the, the war in Ukraine also, well, wars reveal the true strength of actor. That's a general uh, thing. It's the case, for instance, for the, for the Ukrainian army. Uh, so not so many people would have expected so much resistance from um, and so much strength from the Ukrainian army. And I'll say, I think it is also true for uh, powers that are not necessarily directly involved in mili military battlefield, uh, such as the European Union. And um, I agree that many people, many EU officials or member states officials were even surprised by the reaction of the European Union. The European Peace Facility is a very good example. Uh, France in particular supported uh, this instrument during the negotiation. It's a quite recent instrument adopted just last year. We supported this instrument and there was a very important reluctance from many member states uh, about the possibility to have an instrument to finance military equipment and even more to have an instrument financing lethal military equipment. And Every, every, all of this reluctance disappear <laughs> uh, with the crisis in Ukraine. And I think uh, Sweden is a case in point. Sweden was among those countries that were very reluctant towards this instrument. And afterwards, among the first to, to be proud to send javelins to, to Ukraine and, and so on. So in a way, uh, it, uh, it, uh, it, it has a huge impact. On, on where countries uh, stand and, and it's an accelerator and of course it's a tragedy but it's also how through, through tragedies that uh, European integration works because it's in a way a part of uh, how we respond to these tragedies. Um, in terms of the priorities, I think um, the priority uh, the, 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 the strategy compass actually mentions the Versailles uh, summit because that took place uh, in response to the war in Ukraine and the Versailles agenda in which um, leaders uh, emphasis the importance of capabilities because we are in a very important practically virtually all member states want to rearm to increase their, their, their defense budget at the same time and with the same threat in mind. The Russian threat, um, and the territorial defense vis-a-vis -vis Russia, and so on. So, at the same time, it's an opportunity to cooperate because basically we're doing the same thing at the same time. But on the other hand, there is also a huge risk because uh, if we all order the same thing at the same time, perhaps the only outcome could be higher prices, higher delays, uh, and so on. So there is a huge risk if you if we don't do that together and. The, uh, the message from the leaders in the Versailles uh, uh, conclusions were very clear. We have to do that collaboratively and jointly. And the response from the European Commission, from my perspective, it's still moderate, but there is this very important idea that the European Union budget could help and could uh, play the role, of, could subsidize joint procurement, could uh, play the role of, his, of an incentive, just as it was used for research, defense research, uh, the development of military prototype, it can also be used for this next step, uh, acquisition. And obviously, France is very much in favor of European funding for acquisition. We think it is the only way to really create strong incentive for European member states to do this acquisition jointly um, on jointly agreed uh, priorities, in particular NATO, EU, now that they are very aligned, these NATO or EU uh, uh, priorities, um, and joint programs, because we know also that there is also a, a, 
a, a positive spillover going on when you do a clever joint procurement. Afterwards, you can do uh, mutualization of training, of exercise, uh, joint doctrine development, uh, cooperate in terms of logistics, spare parts, and so on. So there are many things that can come afterwards. So we think it is a very good uh, thing to invest in joint procurement. So that could be that should be the priority. Personally, I would say that um, the the proposal from the European Commission um, that was published in um, on the 18th of May, uh, of, uh, of May is not, perhaps not ambitious enough in the sense that it proposed a pilot project for two years, and then we'll see if we can uh, establish a stronger European defense investment program. But I think. We Yeah, I think we lost the states would have spent their money uh, already. So this is my, my, my concern. Thanks, Pierre. Sorry, do you, do you mind? I, I want to I move to Alish and August because we're running out of time. Of course. Um, thank, thank you so much. Um, Alish, um, your foot on these and, and also maybe um, since you, you, um, you know, focus also on the, on the Indo-Pacific area, um, um, anything on, uh, on Japan? Um, okay, thanks. Uh, yeah, let me start with a quick follow up on Japan and and EU and uh, maybe more spe specifically uh, uh, Japan and French relations, Japanese French relations. Um, in a journal that I actually edit, the Central Journal of European, uh, uh, sorry, Central European Journal of International and Security Studies, we are just about to publish a piece, just an article that compares uh, French and Japanese definition of threats in Indo-Pacific, and it it reads uh, documents from from uh, from Japan and France uh, in Japanese and French, and it basically shows how closely these two countries define security uh, challenges, threats, and how they define the region. So it's like brilliant analysis, basically how the perceptions are super aligned uh, in these two countries. So I think that it's kind of a point or, 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 or thing that kind of shows that uh, really uh, there can be like really important and really strong connections between like European and, and uh, Eastern, uh, East, East Asian perspectives. Uh, when it comes to Let's say the question of political will and and the ability to act. Uh, I think uh, obviously the war, the Russia-Ukraine war, uh, it's been super important in that in that regard. But also even before that, uh, I mean, uh, I'm not sure if like uh, you or or the the audience knows about the project uh, called 16 plus one. Uh, you probably know about it, um, which is the project kind of led by China and intended to cooperate with uh, 16 Central and Eastern European countries. Some of those countries are members of EU, some of them are not members, but nevertheless, there was kind of like high trajectory kind of honeymoon between China and the Czech Republic, but also Central and Eastern Europe in general, and uh, around, let's say, 2015, 16. Today, this honeymoon, this potential for honeymoon is kind of over. Uh, the, there, were, there, were, there were high ambitions connected with the 16 plus one platform kind of led by China. Uh, this year, it's 10th anniversary of the project, of the platform, and kind of nobody wants to host it. Nobody wants to meet, actually. So it kind of, I, I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen, how European countries are going to act. Obviously, we have 27 countries. Maybe we need to coordinate with some other actors as well. So I don't know what the actual actions are is going to be. But I, I, I want to say that there is actually a window of opportunity for kind of acting, creating common action and a common response to China, and even try to find some practical solutions and contribute to something in East Asia as well. So I, I, I'm not going to say what it's what it's going to be, uh, but I think there is a significant window, window of opportunity, which is kind of manifested by both like 16 plus one example, Japanese, French uh, coordination or not coordination, but a similar perception example as well. So uh, yeah, I think there's a window of opportunity. And when it comes to priorities, just like super, super quick, uh, I think it's important to have like complex set of responses and priorities. It was me who brought kind of the language of deterring and balancing China and things like that. But I think it's not just, it should not be about 
just these kind of power political measures. And I think we should keep some potential uh, for, for cooperation and just kind of be able to act in a strong and resolute manner, but also be able to, uh, even with China, to have some, some dialogue and, 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 and uh, cooperative, cooperative uh, approach towards China. So thanks. Great, thank you so much. Uh, very clear, very helpful. Um, August, I, it looks like you're going to have the last word, um, but I, I want to ask you uh, maybe a bit about the priorities or any any other question you want to address. Yeah, sure. I mean, I I, uh, I can address this question that you mentioned earlier about whether or not I feel that the strategic compass has any teeth, and I, I think just as Jean Pierre mentioned, uh, of course, the proof is is always in the pudding. Um, and we will see how uh, the EU member states choose to interpret and implement the strategic compass in, in the coming years. Uh, but I, I think the question is essentially sort of what, like, what is it that will make member states interpret it uh, in a in a certain way, and uh, like why will they implement it in a certain way? And I, I think the main factor here, as I mentioned uh, before, is sort of the role of the, of the US uh, and the security um, uh, that they provide through NATO, essentially. Uh, and I think uh, until we see sort of this, this pivot to Asia that, that uh, we've been hearing for many years now, uh, and essentially then a, a, a drawback of sort of US security guarantee in Europe, um, I, I have a hard time seeing that sort of Europe and the EU will will uh, be able to forge a, a genuine common European strategic culture and and threat assessment in the, at least in the near future, uh, but but we will see. Interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, I I'm, we're running out of time. Um, sorry about that, but I think it was a very rich conversation, uh, which I'm not going to try to summarize. Um, but I think, um, let me just say that as an European myself, um, I'm actually delighted that there's such a document there. Um, and, and I agree with what has been said uh, so far. Uh, it's, it's definitely a document that uh, signal an important commitment um, and it also make, gonna make harder for countries to ignore uh, this issue uh, in, in, in the future. Obviously the, the big question remains, uh, there is, uh, an em over, over, obviously an emphasis on, on what is happening in Ukraine. Um, will this focus translate into more action, uh, beyond, uh, the Ukrainian issue, uh, and particularly on the Indo-Pacific? I think we all talk about some clear signs of more strategic engagement in this part of the world. Um, but obviously that's something we will have to see how it evolves. Um, I want to, again, thank you very much for, for taking the time. Um, uh, Jean-Pierre Van Oben, Dr. Pierre Aroche, Dr. Alesh Karmazin, and, and Mr. August Jenison, thank you very much for your comments, for your insights. Um, I also want to thank again uh, the embassies of France, and Ambassador Marc Abensur, the embassy of uh, Czech Republic, and Ambassador Frankova, the embassy of uh, Sweden, and Ambassador Harstedt, and finally, uh, the uh, uh, ambassador of the European Union to Singapore, uh, Her Excellency uh, Ivona Pjorko. Thank you very much for organizing this event. Thank you all uh, for being with us uh, and for taking the time and sharing your questions. And I hope to uh, uh, see you in person, uh, hopefully soon in Singapore. If any of you comes here for the Shangri-La Dialogue, maybe. Um, this um, conversation will be uh, available uh, online uh, as soon as uh, it's been recorded. Um, I hope to see you back uh, on the Lee Kuan Yew School in the future. Thank you again and take care.